We're going to do a little experiment today. Um, prior to the meeting with Jennifer, I'm going to mention to you, the audience, who it is we're going to invite. Today, I'm inviting Carl Jung. You know who that is, um, psychologist. And I'm showing you Greenwich Mean Time exactly when I'm telling you that I'm going to invite Carl Jung to our session, which we will begin at two o'clock. I'll be holding up this at some point during our session to remind you if she does guess or correctly identify that Carl Jung, who I've invited, has shown up. I've also put feelers out for Krishnamurti, David Bohm, and Joseph Campbell. So we'll see which one of these people shows up. But I'm letting you know that I'm saying their name aloud prior to the session. Catch you later. Hello. Yay. How are you? I'm doing fabulous. How are you? I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so weird. You and I together doing this work for the past five years in a restaurant. We get to eat and hang out and laugh, <laughs> tell stories. I get to edit out. But now yes, we are live. We are alive. Besides, oh, besides when it like doesn't let us, we stop. You know, when I freeze. <laughs> okay. Well, today I did invite some people. Okay. And, but of course, I always want to welcome Luana and our class to our session here. You know what? I'm a little bit worried about this. Uh, my internet. I'm not going to worry about it right this second. But if I freeze, we'll know why. But Luana, is there anyone you want us to speak to prior to the people that I've invited? You showed me your head. So whatever. No. Whatever's in there. Yeah. Rattle. Um, okay, I decided to try a little bit of an experiment today, okay. which is prior to starting, I held up this clock, which is the Greenwich Mean Time, and I said the person that I was inviting, I said their name aloud. Okay. I'm going to give you some hints. Let's just see if he shows up. Do, I know, do I know this person? Uh, you saw him once before in our class. We glossed over him. He's not somebody that we invited before, but you suddenly said so-and-so is here, and I glossed over it, be thinking, what the heck is he doing here? So it's a he. It's somebody that you recognized. I wouldn't recognize this person, but you clearly said this person is here. All right, it's not so him. Let's ask, before we get to his name, or his first name, and we'll get to it. Question for Luana, is he available? Does he want to talk to us? Yes. Okay. Now, I did invite like four people. <laughs> you know, we'll just run, run them in. But this one particular person that I spoke of, he showed up in a class we were talking to somebody on the flip side and you said, oh, this guy is here. And I said, are you, are you talking about the same guy that whatever? So Luana, put a visual in Jennifer's mind who this person might be or first name. Is there anything with Adams or Brian? No, not a musician, a scientist. Let's call him that, a scientist, somebody in the science world, not somebody we've talked to before, scientist-wise, but somebody in that world. So coloring-wise, he'd probably look a little bit more like me. <laughs> I No, I know. I'm looking, and I know you're, like, I got Einstein, but I don't know if that's, we've already talked to Einstein, haven't we've we? We've already talked. We've talked to Albert. Right. Um, he's of that era. Let's allow that. So Albert coming through is a way to guide us to this person. Uh, uh, um, Tesla. 
We talked to Tesla. Oh, hold on. This person shares a first name with somebody we interviewed in that group of four. We Carl, interviewed. Carl Young. That's it. Ding. Ding. Okay. Well, he told, I didn't think he was, a, that's so funny. Why would you say Carl Young? Because they showed that to me right away, but I actually, I'm like, no, we're talking to a scientist. Okay, he is a scientist. That's the time that it took for you to give me Carl Jung's name. I could have been, I could have like. You could have like, bang. But here's my question. How do you know what Carl Jung looks like? I don't know what he looks like. He just told me the name and said Carl Jung. And I wish I would have listened. Well, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's not a contest. I didn't even oh. know if we talked before. Okay. All right, so Carl. Our friend, why did you show up the last time? You showed up and out of nowhere. I did. We hadn't asked for you. You showed up. What's going on? Why did you show up? He had something to add. And he showed me the oceans and the moisture and whatever we were talking about. Okay, that's accurate. We were talking about how to change salt water to fresh water. And we were asking our scientists to weigh in. And each one of them gave us a, an idea. And that's all in the book Backstage Pass to the Flipside okay. 3. But I felt amiss that I hadn't asked you some questions, sir. So can we ask you some questions now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who was there to greet you when you crossed over? I'm feeling very strongly it was his mother. Okay, very good. Her name was, do you want me to give it to you? Ellen, I almost want to say Very Ellen. close, very close. Ellen, I'm sorry, Emily. Emily. Okay. Emily. And you, she had a strong influence on you, according to your books written about you. Would you want to show Jennifer what that was? What was it about Emily that was related to this work? I felt physics, but I don't know. Hold on. It's a funny way to put it. Well, I saw a suffragette. So I felt somebody that was like, I just got um, strong, strong influence. Yeah, strong strong influence. Well, I saw, I saw Susan B. Anthony when he. Okay. Well, here's what I want to ask you, sir. Emily had a profound effect on your life for a number of reasons, including that uh, she could see things, oh. like Jennifer. Oh, yeah. You know what's so funny is because they showed me Lily Dale, they showed me Susan B. Anthony. Oh, Lily Dale, which is where all the psychics and mediums in the United States go. Very good. We call that Disneyland. So I. I want to ask you about that. There were some very profound spiritual events that happened with you. One was when you were a kid, you, you claimed or you said you saw your mother would go into a room and commune with spirits. And once you actually saw a spirit walking out of her room, do you recall that? It was her mother. It was her mother. Okay, very good. You used to, uh, you had a, when you were a small child, you used to have something you called a soul stone. It was like a carved object. It's, like a, it's either a sundial. It feels like a sundial. Now, let's focus on that for a second. I just saw Joseph Smith with the seer stone. Okay. But let's focus on this sundial. Uh, okay. so, did you say sundial? It looked like a sundial. I just had like a little marking and a little then... little marking and well, also, he carved it. I also saw the Mayan calendar. Like something... Mayan calendar. Let's hold on to that. So, okay. sir, where, did you have a past life as a, a native, uh, an Aboriginal person? Thousand, Absolutely. Yeah, a thousand percent. A thousand percent. Tell me, where was it? South America, North America, Europe, where, where Australia? I felt like Belize. I've been there and you showed it to me in my mind, Belize. So. Belize, okay, so Central America. And when you were a small child, you had a you had this carving that you used to bring up into your room and you would put notes to it. And later on, you would this became a thing that you would focus on. Yeah. Is that correct? 
And at some point, and it had properties in it. He said it had like magnetic properties in it. Something that, well, it's a seer. So if I was seeing a seer, like a seer stone, yeah. yeah. Even though I don't know what that means. Well, <laughs> it's a, it was a thing, an object that people use in the 1800s, where, where that would give, grant them some kind of powers to see and beyond. And it was bunked <laughs> often. Let's just put it that way. And people used it or claimed to hold up the seer stone and they'd say, well, I can read what God, you know, so it became a, a weird object. But in his case, he wrote about it. So his soul stone is, is the way he referred to it. Soul stone. Was, oh. instru wow. That's was instrumental in his spiritual journey. It contained all of his lives in one. And so you were connecting to that as a child. Uh, yes. At some point, um, I'm skipping around. Did he become vegan, if you don't mind me asking, or vegetarian? Because he said between the lives, he didn't, like, I think he used to hunt before. And oh, then... He was a hunter at one point and stopped that. Yeah. You went to India at some point in your life and you studied there and, and did that journey, I think. Or maybe I'm, mm -hmm. I'm mixing that up with... Uh, I could be mixing that up with Joseph Campbell. My apologies. But at some point you met this guy, Sigmund. Freud. And you guys, and he brought you along and he made you part of his world. But then you had a falling out. Do you want to show Jennifer what that was over? A female. Felt like it. I think it was a patient. Because on one hand, well, correct me if I'm wrong, that just popped into my head. Was Freud having an affair or a relationship with one of his clients? Hold on. Or were you? He was. Which? Freud he, or Carl? He was having a relationship with one of his clients. Carl was. There mm -hmm. were um, two women that you were supposedly had, af had affairs with. Do you want to put them into Jennifer's mind? I don't know, it made me think of Salvador Dali and you, his muses, but the two women. Interesting guy, yeah. Sabrina and Tony are the two names that I come up with. But and my point is, so Freud was upset with you for having a relationship. Now, I didn't see the movie. I know there was a movie about this relationship with you guys. So I'm sorry to say I haven't seen it, but you're saying it was accurate in the sense that you were having a fling with one of your clients. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, he was. Let's, I'm going to skip around because that's mundane stuff. What happened to you on the planet? Once you got to the other side, what was that like for you? Once you realized there was an afterlife. Blissful. Blissful. And he said towards the end, he was going back and forth. And it was something he recognized, he said. I see. So there was something really wrong with his heart. Showing That's me? correct. He died of cardiovascular okay. complications. I don't know, but that's what he said. You, know, you wouldn't. I had to look this up. I didn't know. I, you know, I couldn't spot Carl out of a lineup, but... You know, I, you did. And so here we are interviewing it. Okay. I had somebody give me a couple of questions for you. One, you never went to Italy. Why is that? Oh. Well, you talked about it, but you never went. He's just saying it. Like, like at first I thought war, but I, you know, I wasn't. It Past wasn't. life memory? past life memory of like some war or some distaste for it. But then I got that there was no work for him to be. Oh, so a combination of the right. dread of the memory and nothing to do there. Right. Okay. And second question was that you never did meditation or hypnosis oh, for a fear of being lost or something. Is that accurate? Hold on. He just showed me something else. One of the two girls that he had an affair with were Italian, was Italian. Oh. <laughs> so Good I, choice. I don't know. My kid. <laughs> My cosa fa. He wanted to show me that. Then, 
your question about about um, him not doing hypnosis. Hold on. He said he dreaded it. Feared it or afraid of it? He said it was challenging enough for him to sleep. I see. And later in life, in the book that you wrote, it's called The Red Book. And it almost feels like he was afraid that someone was going to take something from him, either his mind or, I know you said lost, but it almost felt like somebody was going to take his knowledge or something. Or he, he would lose it. Lose you it. were the one who came up with the concept of the collective unconscious. The idea that when a person dies, their energy doesn't stop here, but then goes back to the flip side and gets into this pool. He told me because they thought I was a quack. You showed they me thought you quack. were a quack. However, so let's talk about that for a second. Then he showed me Einstein. That's interesting. Okay, but is it a collective unconscious all being shared? I mean, we're having a conversation with you. So this is specifically your consciousness, correct? We're not tapping into somebody else next to you. He said yes. Okay, so no, I was I was interested because my son told me that he goes, I think you just tap into a phone line that no one else can. I'm like, this is what some scientists, the hardcore I, ones. I know, but if I didn't see spirit floating around, I wouldn't have believed it in it for the, in the first place. I think the only reason why I was allowed to see it was because I wouldn't have believed it. But because I physically see it when I go to bed at night, last night I had to tell them to let me go to sleep. Like when I go, like I see it, all, I can see it all, all the time. Time. Yeah. I would have never believed in the, I would have believed more in the collective. To me, that just it's, makes more sense. It makes sense. And he showed why it made sense. But my point is, once you got to the flip side, you realized that was inaccurate. Is that correct? Or it was a variation of accuracy. Oh, Interesting. So he showed me all the different levels, like so all the different dimensions of where you're at. He said it was a collective consciousness, but of yourself. Of yourself. That's very important because people do this thing where they think you just float off and mediums are picking up on somebody else's lifetime. No. So, and that leads us to the next I'm question. Like, I'm like, no, that's not my ego at all. No. So the next question is you were somebody who talked a lot about synchronicity but you ascribe synchronicity being something that was random or chaotic. From your perspective now, do you see synchronicity in a different fashion, more like architecture? You can say that, but hold on. More like divine lights combustion, combusting in one another. So, It's more of a math sequence of the infinite kind. A math sequence. So infinite. synchronicity, that's what he's answering. Synchronicity yeah. is a mathematical sequence related to the combustion of the universe, light, Absolutely. how things work. But he, thousand percent. He showed me the square root of pi and the infinite square root of pi. So for our minds, the infinite square root of pi is this like sort of amorphous thing that we can't pin down because it goes on ad finitum, literally. But what he's saying is that... There's a book called Blue where a savant actually did it in the 30,000th, like in sequence. Oh, he like, went all the way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in, in this savant <laughs> story, what you're saying is that synchronicity is related to mathematics so that if you had the mathematics in front of you, you could figure out why it was you ran into your ex-girlfriend in a street in Paris 20 years after you met. Oh, is that what he says? Right on. Oh, that's okay. what it's the only place that I ever get that. It's so cool. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to make it easy for us to comprehend what he's saying, that synchronicity exists not as a chaotic universe blast or an airplane flying overhead. Sorry about that. That's usually helicopters. There we go. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. From the bill, most people don't realize 
that Carl Jung was responsible for AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. Is that correct? That's so interesting that you're bringing that up today. Okay. All right. So, Carl, explain to her how that sentence. How are you connected to Bill Wilson? They were both paid to do something. Like either some type of, like, I can't quite make it out, but it feels like they were both worked on a project or something. They, well, they did in this sense. Carl was involved with something called the Oxford Group, which was dealing with people with trauma. That's it, okay. And, and he was the first person to say, when somebody has a religious epiphany, they can change their psychosis if they're having a you know, dramatic depression and then they have a religious event and then suddenly everything shifts. So he was the first person to say, try to focus on a religious experience and that will help you. And that eventually became what Bill Wilson was introduced to him and the two of them worked together on this idea of giving up yourself to Jesus in the AA sort of, you know, right. pantheon. So, but an indirect connection. But Carl, have you met Jesus since you've been over there? Many times, Many yes. Times. And what was your first impression of him, if you don't mind me asking? Because you put out a thought. Hold on, it's pretty fascinating the way you showed it to me. I just want to make sure I get it right. You put out a thought and he comes. It's just, you know, it's just... Boom. Well, just like you did. And then he showed me you in my mind's eye, how you wanted to talk to him and he came. So it's easier, let's say, if you're on the flip side to ask him to come forward or does it matter? It doesn't matter. The difference is, is that we know we can on the flip side. Ah, that's the difference. We know we can. It refers the same sentence we hear often in our work. I know I still exist. My loved ones don't believe that I do. So the idea that knowing that you can call Jesus or speak to Jesus or invite him forward is completely different than imagining or praying or whatever, right. receiving. But right. here we are hearing it from Carl, who just proved who he is. Yeah. <laughs> So you had some profound spiritual experiences as a young man, then later in life. At 11 years old. At 11, okay. I was something around 26. And at what point did you realize, was it when you got back to the flip side that you were just seeing the conscious energy of people? Oh, he said he realized it when his mother took his hand. Very good. And he was just so happy. So happy to see her. And she was so mad that he didn't talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, let me ask you this, Carl. She had that ability. Came to him in his dream state, which then he believed was real. I see. So he had that ability. And if we're going to call it ability, Jennifer and I have talked a lot about this. It appears to be related to the filters on the brain. And mediums have less filters, let's say, or they've been altered in some way. And from seizures. From seizures. And Carl, is it genetic? Do some people carry that gene of less filters from life to life? Okay, thank you. What was that compliment? He said, it's an honor to have that gene. It's an honor to- I nice to hear that. To have it, um, okay. Now I'm getting that, but I didn't get that when I was burned at the stake or I was- <laughs> She didn't get that in a previous life, yeah. That. I still fought for it, but everyone has a particular situation where they can have it 
it can be all encompassing, meaning that you could be a mathematician and get things, you know, or get visions or whatever, like Einstein did and like what he did. Yeah. But, um, okay. Say that again. Give me the question again. I'm so sorry. Well, I'd like to follow up with a general discussion about filters on the brain. So, some children under the age of eight don't have them. Mediums don't appear to have them. People have a near-death experience, out-of-body experience, guided meditation, or deep hypnosis are able to shift their filters and access the flip side. Right. Is that something you recommend people should do, try to do, attempt to do? Interesting. He showed me, he showed me, that was really fascinating. So everybody can try to have it. The more that they use the pineal, pineal gland, if I'm seeing this right, and then he showed me like it taking away those filters. Interesting. So it's like but related. So that's related to like wherever somebody, the filters are. Like somebody that needs insulin shots. You give them insulin shots and it goes straight, you know, then they have insulin. So oh, this leads me to another question, Carl. Are the filters physiological? I mean, literally, is it, or is it a frequency uh, aberration or adjustment? It's a frequency. Okay. So theoretically, people could figure out a way to wear a set of headphones. It'd have to be related to them. Meditation. Meditation. Okay, thank you. That's just the simplest way. And that's a brilliant way to put it. Thank you. Meditation. Wow. I did it this morning. I've, I've never done it as soon as I wake up, and I did it this morning. And I'm telling you, it calmed me down. It was crazy how much it could work. Meditation. Yeah. Right. Well, somebody else that we haven't spoken to, he, we haven't invited him into class, but I'm, I've been quoting him lately. He's a scientist named David Bohm. And I don't know if he wants to talk to us today, but he's the one who pointed out to me that meditation is Latin for measuring. Med means to measure. So if you want to analyze or measure something, an experience, that's what meditation is. It's not a religious practice. By no. Any stretch of the imagination. You're measuring reality and how to navigate it. Um, but I, I wanted to ask... And that will get rid of your filters. And that will get rid of your filters. So have you reconciled with Sigmund? You're talking about David? I'm talking, well, I'm, Carl, I, I know what the answer is. Of course you have. Okay. David... You said David, so I wasn't sure who you I did say David. I did say David Bohm. Well, Luana, you know who I called out to today. Who needs to come and speak to us? I asked for Joseph Campbell, David Bohm, or, jo or uh, Krishnamurti. All three are related, but it's up to them. Lou? And Carl, I didn't mean to speak on your behalf, but we know I, you've reconciled. I know I love Joseph Campbell's work. I don't know much about David, but that doesn't matter. He wants to talk to that Christian Murdy. Christian Murdy. All right. Can we invite Christian Murdy forward? Krish. <laughs> What's it up? It's me and my clipboard, guys. Okay, very good. All right. So... Uh, first of all, let me say welcome to our class. I don't think we, we might have had a tiny conversation once before, but I want to welcome you to our class. And Luana, you, perhaps you've met her. Maybe she already prepped you. Yep. What would you like to say? Well, first of all, let me ask you, can I ask you some mundane questions, simple things? Who was there to greet you when you crossed over? I felt like his son or a child. Okay. Not a child, but somebody that... Somebody that felt like a son. Felt like a son. Was it a son or was it your assistant as you remembered him as a young man? 
I guess that's it. Yeah. I think his name is Nita, Nitya, something like that. He had a great they, love for Nitya. Yes. They were super close. They lived together. They traveled together. They were discovered together. Um, and I know that he ended up in Ojai, California. Hmm. Uh, partially because Nitya had tuberculosis and he needed the, you know, the atmosphere. But may I ask you, sir, so he was there to greet you. That must have been, what was that like for you, meeting him, seeing him? Bliss, happiness, love. Love. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. You had an experience he in Ojai. Oh, go ahead. He said, if someone could be your everything, that's who he was to him. Beautiful. Yeah. You had a spiritual experience in Ojai. I think you were, um, it, might have, it was in 1922. Did they have- Wanna show it to Jennifer? Tell her about it? They have sweat caves or sweat places, like a- Even like a Native American sweat lodge kind of a thing? I don't, well, let's ask him. You mean in Ojai or do you mean in India? Felt like Ojai. Okay. It, was there a place you would go to meditate and be a part? I feel like he did that everywhere. Okay. But so the spiritual experience that you had, the, are you saying it's the equivalent of like Plato's cave or going into a cave or... Yeah. I, uh, yes. I like Show it to Jennifer. What happened? You had a boat, a boat, a booty, uh, sorry, a okay. Bodhi tree. He showed me the Bodhi tree and he just showed me a cave in the Buddha. Okay. Like, oh, thank you. Very good. I written it down here. Sorry. Bodhi tree experience. So, but let's talk about it. So you were, this was about 1922. I think you were maybe 27, something like that years old, maybe 30. What happened? So were you meditating and you went somewhere? Was it a near death experience? What was it? It almost felt like he was there for like 72 hours. Like he didn't. Three days. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Um, Which is the same as uh, the Buddha, I think, according to legend. Doesn't matter. Time-wise, it's not like the 74th hour. There. I felt like he didn't move. I felt like he was there for, and I felt like he was hungry. So I don't know if he, huh. like... I understand. I understand. Just totally. So where did you go? Did you go into the flip side? Did you go where you are now? Almost felt like he went across the continent or went across the sea. Um, where did you go? Did you, I mean, did you go to another realm? Yes. He was visited. Ah, frozen. Here we go. Pause. Hi, we're back. We're back. Okay. So, so uh, I said that he got, he was, you know, I was being shown like Joseph Smith being with angels that visited him. And like, that's the experience that I feel like he had with a different either. Um, like an epiphany. He had an epiphany, but the Bodhivita, uh, the Bodhivita or the Bodhisattva experience. Sorry. And then he just felt his whole body changed. He felt it, he, it almost felt like he levitated. So, which is also saying that he was going back and forth in the other direction, like in the other dimensions. Okay. And I mean, you know, I'm coming to this information in a new way. It's not something I'm really familiar with. I'm familiar with the Buddha's three days and talking to various entities and understanding the nature of reality. But this epiphany that you had changed your life. And I'm just, trying to point this out. And from that point forward, you left the Theosophical Society that had sort of adopted you, and you became this teacher of your own right. Is that correct? 
Almost like he was kicked out, <laughs> he said. Okay, the, I think that was because they he wouldn't obey what they wanted him to do. It's like, I didn't just leave, I got kicked out, but yes. Well, we're hearing it from the horse's mouth. But this experience that you had, you also became very connected to a scientist like David Bohm, who had studied quantum theory, quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And when he found you, the two of you had decades of conversations at the recorded that are at the Krishnamurti uh, Estate Museum. He shows me us. <laughs> Having our conversation. So he shows me us. That's cute. Um, why not? But in terms of your experience now, how accurate were your conversations with regard to what you're experiencing now? He said they're about 80% accurate. That's a lot. And then he went down to 69. I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> Well, what do you mean? Do you mean, well, I mean, in terms of, we talked, you talked about oneness and about, um, I mean, I'll hmm. give you a sentence. My wife had a dream where she was talking to the astrophysicist Mino and Japanese guy. And he said, uh, the, the reality is both particle and wave. When you're incarnated, it feels more particle than wave. And when you're not in body form, it feels more wave than particle. Relating to quantum mechanics, is that accurate? It is accurate. So your experience is more wave than particle, meaning more connected to everything. You showed me everything being like, you know, all connected. Yeah. Yeah. So that experience of feeling connected more of the time or all the time, I don't know, as opposed to here where we feel disconnected. It takes work for us to realize we're connected. He tried going back to that experience over and over to try to put it in a mathematical equation over and over again. I see. Very good. Well, that was, I mean, what an unusual thing. There was also a moment where you saw your sister when you were young and your mother, I think. It's like you saw them in an apparition form. Is, what happened? Or explain that to Jennifer. Oh, that's when he was young, yeah. Um, I was scared. And then, then you showed me Carl Young's mom taking, you know, his hand when he got into heaven. Or I call it, I'm going to call it heaven. Um, oh, 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 oh. Um, okay, show me again. You were scared and then what? And then he said he had this overwhelming feeling of love. When he, he said he first was really scared and then he had this overwhelming feeling of love and something switched in his mind knowing that it was there's something more than just here i see that he epiphany that epiphany he chased it he chased it for the rest of his life and i've met a number of people and read about people who have that experience of feeling connected to everything and everything is one Mario Beauregard, PhD. I read about it from Sir Francis Young, husband of all people. My wife even had it one day where you just, everything is connected and it feels connected. Mm -hmm. Something like that. So it's a, oh, I have a question for you. My friend, agent, Joel. Okay. Has it been a follower of yours for a long time? And we talked about Sandra, uh, Sandra Nicholson, and she also had seen you with Harry Dean Stanton, of all people, our friend in our class, a number of times. Is there anything you want to tell Joel? He showed me Joel's hat. So I don't know if he wears a hat, but there's something with either 
Okay, hold on. Maybe Chip were at. No, I think he's telling him he needs to enjoy life more. Toss up the hat. Like hang up your hat kind of thing, but don't feel it because he's so terrified of. You're telling my agent to retire? Thanks a lot, Krishna. Murray. <laughs> Hold on. It's all right. Maybe he should. Yeah, he is. He is not telling doing anything for me. He's um, <laughs> to retire. Okay. Any messages to your fans or friends or people who love you, Krishna Murdy? Jita, Jidu? Huh. There's no time like today. I'm like, there's no time like the present. And he goes, there's no time like today. To feel the presence of your higher self, that oneness that you can have with all of yourselves. Um, and know how loved you are. So putting your hand, like, you know, um, putting your hand on your heart and just like we've discussed before, what I've heard from other people, um, uh, there's, it's a way to connect to yourself and ask what your heart needs. Very good. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Mr. Ohi, there are some people here in our class. And he said to get over yourself. <laughs> Get over yourself. Get over yourself. Get over it. Well, we have a number of Ojai people in our class, people from Ojai, people who lived up there near you, around you. Are you planning on coming back soon? He's, I'm already there. <laughs> so part of him's already here somewhere. Somewhere. Okay. Uh, what country are you in? He says he has... The Ukraine. Ukraine. Okay. A boy or girl? Feels like a girl. Will you be doing spiritual kind of work in your life? He's learning how to cook. <laughs> <laughs> That's a spiritual thing. I'd make the ballet and he goes, no, I'm learning how to cook. And then eventually I'll get, you know, eventually I'll get there. Oh, very good. Cool. Okay. Will she become aware of you and your work at some point in her life or? Yes. She will. All right. Very cool. About how old is she now? Thirteen. Okay. And her first name? We don't want to in, invade her privacy, but. It's okay with the first name. It's easy. I won't be able to get, I can't even pronounce okay. it. And you know, God forbid she runs into it and watches this sometime in the future and goes, I was led here. It's all good. Luana, who else do we need to speak to? I've only got her for about 10 more minutes. So does Joseph Campbell want to come forward? Does David Bohm want to come forward? Or does somebody else? Or does, do these guys want to come? Billy Paxson kept coming forward. Well, he's the other guy from Ojai. Oh, okay. That's right. He and Krishnamurti lived in the same town. Billy, what do you want to say, my friend? He says, I think this is great for so many people. And it's not just from here, but for people up there, people that are going to hear this later, it's just, it's, 
it's raising the vibration for everyone that listens to it. Even if they don't believe it and they think it's corny, he says, or honky tonky or something like that. <laughs> That's not like that part of their life, they'll be able to reflect on this and go, oh, I remember hearing that. Or oh, I remember this. Yeah. You know? And oh, he's showing me your son. Hold on. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> Something with your son. Yeah, it was his birthday, birthday. This week, says, a couple of days ago. Um, and then he says, hold on. Oh, that you're eating a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> he knows I'm eating a lot more better. I'm kidding. Bill? Yeah. He's saying you're eating a lot. Come better. on, Bill. You are, uh, you have a unique voice. You always did. You always have a unique way of putting things. And you know, when we ask for scientists and. He asked me Twister. He goes, I was in the movie Twister. <laughs> like he was showing <laughs> I think. Uh, My point is this. On the flip side, Bill's a, a poet. And he always was. And as I knew him, he was always a deep thinker. And as a film director and a film creator, just a deep, cool, charming guy. Yeah. And every time you show up, it's fun for us. So what do you got to say? We've got Krishnamurti here. What would you ask Krishnamurti? Or what do you want to ask Carl Jung or Joseph Campbell? Follow your bliss. But. He just showed me how are we going to plant more trees? Like he was showing me. Um, okay, show me again. That's interesting. He said, you should ask about archetypes. Archetypes? Archetypes, very good, thank you, sir. How about that? Great question, like, it's for Carl Jung. He invented the term archetypes. What, what is it? Yeah, just go with it. He invented this term, archetypes. I love that Bill steps in, you're a better interviewer than me. What is it about archetypes? Where does that come from? And what's your observation of them now? So I barely scratched the surface then. And so scratch a little bit of the surface for us. What is an archetype? Is it bigger, there are much bigger energies than I could have imagined, he says. So let's just follow this for a second. An archetype like Michael the Guardian Archangel, an archetype, something like that? Yes, it's a power. A power. And so we've run into. It's a power that can be harnessed. How do you harness it? Well, I don't know. He just showed me that you bring it in. Um, I don't know. Okay, hold on. No, no, we're going to ask Carl. Here's the thing. We've had Michael show up in sessions and he'll say, I'm Michael the Archangel. And I'll ask him, like, are you the same Archangel that the other person? And And they always say we're part of the same frequency. So the right. archetype of Jesus, that's an easier one, okay? Perhaps, because we know we don't know if Michael lived on the planet, but we do know that Jesus did. Let's allow that. So Jesus, step in, please. Carl? He's busy. <laughs> I know you're busy, but yeah, you're in the distance. But Carl, let's talk about our friend Jesus. How is he an archetype or is he an archetype? He just showed me the heart and he made me feel love and kindness to oneself and others. So he's an archetype of feeling, having love and compassion for yourself. So each archetype, archetype courage, um, unconditional love, various different forms of what we try to achieve an endeavor in a lifetime. What you're saying is there are beings, let's not call them people for the sake of this discussion, who embody that frequency. Is that it? Yes, absolutely. How many, let's just ask, how many Jesus archetypes are out there, unconditional love people? Millions? Thousands. Can you imagine what that would do if everyone had that? Or understood how to harness it. How to harness it. 
I think this and the other thing that Bill Paxton said is like this is a whole different chapter or a whole different like because there's no so, yeah it's a whole conversation you know I, which we don't have the time for. However, Bill, you brought it up. How do we harness the archetype? Meditate, place it in your heart. You can, you can actually like feel like it's in like, put it, oh, I want to say put it in your hands. Put it in your hands, put it in your heart, meaning pull it down, pull it towards you. Know that you already have it and you're bringing it out. You're tuning it in. You're tuning in to whatever that frequency is. I know there's more to this. I know there's more to this, but yes, that's the beginning of it. Okay. Well, Bill, I think it's a brilliant thing to bring up, which is how do we tune into healing, tune into courage, tune into love. And I yep. know I'm love, love. you. Love, love. <laughs> love, love. It was Robin's birthday. I know. He just popped in. He's like, love, love. So he's popped in. You said he popped into a couple of your sessions this past week. There has. Yeah. And what does he say? He's got to say more than just love, love. He popped in on his birthday and I didn't get like twice that day. It was just so fascinating to me. And I didn't find out until later it was his birthday. <laughs> and what did he say? Or what did he appear as? Or what was his? I remember it, but it had to do. Oh, actually one of them it had to do with some who, somebody who was feeling sick. I kept seeing that it had to do with the way he felt sick with his heart. I see. Yeah. Healing. So Robin, give us a archetype idea of how to pull in healing energy to solve the problem of feeling unwell or depressed. Colors. Pulling in colors. So how would you do it? What color would you pull in? Whatever colors are healing to you. It's different for everybody. Well, you, Robin, what would you pull in? What would the colors be for you? Pink and gold. Pink and gold. And you picture them? Mm -hmm. Or you put them in your house or you sit in a pink and gold room? You just put them all over you. You put okay, them. Okay, that's a little weird. You Paint yourself it, up pink and gold? No, no. You I'm put kidding. it inside of you. You put it inside of you. That was horrible. Put it inside of you. Okay. So that energy of those two lights, pink and gold, pull it inside your heart. And love yourself? What? Okay, you you're making this really <laughs> I'm milking every moment. I know I'm going to lose you in like two minutes. I'm just pulling. I need to go. I can't do that. I know you can't. All right. A whole nother episode. A whole nother episode. We love you. Thank you, class. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, uh, Joseph Campbell. Follow your bliss. We're going to talk about that at a future date. Yes, Thank you all, Billy. And thanks for asking that question about archetypes to the one and only Carl Young, who invented the term. Didn't know that. All right. Bye. Love you. Love, love. Bye, hon. Bye.